Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to our special meeting. Um, I think it's probably our first special meeting, but we can make it up whenever we want to have a special meeting, we can have one. And today we're uh, very pleased to have Sam giving us a talk. And for once, I'm actually going to read out the biography that Sam has sent us so that it's on the recording. But Sam studied music at Guildhall School of Music and Dartington College of Arts. He carried out extensive field work in song, music and oral history from the 1970s onwards. His sound archive is now held by the British Library. In the 1970s and 80s, he performed in folk clubs. As a composer, performer of more experimental music, he has had performances throughout the West Country, London, San Francisco, and National BBC Radio. He's had books published, notably Sonic Harvest, Towards Musical Democracy, The Engaged Musician, I presume that's not a misprint for Enraged Musician, uh, The Engaged Musician, John Cage as, and Soundings. It's very... His very good song, very well sung, The Myth of Folk Song, awaits publication. So thank you, Sam, for joining us this afternoon. And um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you could fire away. You're muted, Sam. Oh. Hey. That's Sorry. it. That's, That's it. it. <coughs> All right. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> Coughing on cue. Um, and, and thank you also for giving me the opportunity to share some of these ideas of mine, which have been buzzing around in my head for decades. And we'll see how we go. I've got quite a lot to get through. I think as a start, I'll just say that I, I think it's a reasonable assumption that all of us here today, members of this group and people who involve ourselves in vernacular song and music are perfectly comfortable with the idea of orality, oral tradition, oral transmission, the wider subject of oral culture, um, perhaps oral composition as well. But if we were musicologists, the case might be a little different. I know that as musicology has been changing in recent times. We now have transcultural musicology, for example, but still uh, historical musicology tends to be rooted in tangible texts, either written or printed, and has a, a less than easy relationship with orality. <clears throat> As I say, I do know that that's changing. Um, but even so, for all the more expansive views of recent years within historic and musicological traditions, we can still detect a kind of evolutionary model of early, classical and modern, which basically outlines the development of written music. This certainly impacts on how music history is taught. If today's school student wants to do GCSE music, for example, they need, I think it's grade three, or is it four, on an instrument to study uh, to, to show that they can play, uh, and that means, of course, reading music, um, and their study subjects have to include at least one paper on Western classical music from 1650 to 1900. <coughs> or at least that's how it was when I last checked, which is within the last year. Uh, <coughs> the performance element of GCSE and also A-level music also demands a musical score or a lead sheet. In higher education, it's true, you can study non-literate aspects of music, such as music technology or popular styles, but overwhelmingly, <coughs> the term music history still means what it meant when I was at music college donkey's years ago, notated European so-called classical music from perhaps the Renaissance to early modernism. Or in other words, the traditions that we study in this group, vernacular song and music, may be used as an option at these levels, but are never a requirement. And just as 50 years ago, the word music uh, 
had no real need of an adjective such as classical, uh, yet many other forms have qualifying adjectives such as popular or folk or prefixes such as ethno or the somewhat ghastly world music. At the outset, I'll say that I regard this as a one-sided view and restrictive and incomplete. As someone who is equally at home with a Beethoven symphony or a sea shanty, uh, a piece by John Cage or a child ballad, it seems to me clear that if the purpose of music history is to foster an understanding and appreciation of humanity's adventures in music, the practice of leaving out half the story, in fact, most of the story, is to the detriment of both oral and written traditions alike. Let me just read you a sentence by the American folklorist, the late Alan Dundas. He wrote, in modern times, we tend to rely heavily on print or other means of recording data. And we fail to realize that humankind throughout most of its collective history depended almost exclusively on orally transmitted knowledge. And I will certainly say amen to that. So the bee that's been in my bonnet, as I said, for decades, and I'm gonna let it out this afternoon to buzz around a little bit, is that European music history should be thought of and taught as a continuous interaction between oral and written modes of transmission. That applies at least from the ninth century onwards when musical notation first appeared. And I, but I'm going to start with a series of anecdotes, or we might call them case histories. <clears throat> the first one is about a local singer that I've written about elsewhere, Bill Hingston. We all knew him as Pop, he was a lovely guy, and he lived in the village of Dittisham on the River Dart in South Devon. And uh, any Friday or Saturday while he was alive, he could be uh, found playing his one row melodeon or singing songs at the Ferry Boat Inn pretty well every week. Not far from Dittisham, where Pop lived, maybe 10 miles, is the Dartington Hall Estate, where there is an annual summer school of music, internationally known, and attracting some highly regarded classical and very occasional jazz musicians. I note that in more recent years, some folk revival performers have begun to appear on the fringe. I'm going back many years to when one of the regular attendees was a guy called Rodney. He was a Westminster chorister, obviously a trained voice, uh, and he usually attended for the whole month of the summer school. And I don't know how Rodney discovered Pop Hingston, but he told me how well Pop breathed and produced his voice. He was very much in awe of him. And he loved the pub scene with music and songs so much that our friend Rodney could not resist joining in. So he would turn up to the pub with his sheet music in his little music case and at some moment would ping his tuning fork and give forth some light classic such as The Fisherman of England or um, Devon, Glorious Devon, the kind of songs that uh, Peter Dawson or Owen Brannigan were once famous for. Rodney, of course, had a trained voice. He enunciated clearly, projected and stayed perfectly in tune. Pop absolutely loved it. But there was definitely a kind of unintended humorous aspect to this classical singer, quite unconscious of how incongruous he was using concert platform delivery in a little country pub. But this is why I cite this tale. Rodney learned a couple of pop songs. One that I definitely remember was The Herring's Head, which Rodney sang when in other pubs or to his friends, but definitely outside Pop's uh, uh, company. Pop, on the other hand, picked out on his melodeon the tunes to a couple of Rodney's, Rodney's songs with due iron, ironing out of the sort of chromatic notes, which always happens when these songs go on to one row instruments. And he, re he remembered these songs of Rodney's and till the day he died. And I often remember him saying, come on, let's have one of Rodney's when we were having a bit of a session. And to Rodney, Pop's oral songs were definitely not hide 
to classical music's just Jekyll, uh, nor vice versa. They coexisted. And I had the privilege of seeing them pass from one to the other with complete ease. So that's one anecdote. Here's a second one. I'll play you a bit of this one as a recording, a field recording. This is a, a singer from Alsford in Hampshire. His name was Bob Mills. He was a retired cowman. He had shown cattle in, in big shows and won prizes. And he had a, a repertoire of fairly typical um, rural songs like All Jolly Fellows or Jim the Carter Lad or whatever. But he also knew the, the broadside ballad of Balaclava, Charge of the Light Brigade, learnt by ear, not from a printed source. As far as I know, Bob didn't learn anything from a printed source. But the interesting thing is that his performance, uh, it began as Balaclava, the broadside ballad, and it ended as the poem by Tennyson. Just listen to how he did it. Can we get this first example up, um, Martin? Not sure if Martin heard me. We're not hearing anything. Oh, right. Hang on, he's woken up. I forgot that I'd muted myself. <laughs> there was six hundred against six score thousand fall, ending by furious cannon and crushed by savage blow. Yet for they were like here all, for their noble England's name, the glorious charge hero we call that bally clover's fame. Four hundred of those warriors fell fighting where they stood, yet in that fatal vale of death, enriched with English blood, four hundred of those soldiers bequeathed their lives away, for the England they had fought so well on that wild October day. Oh, tis a famous story, proclaiming far and wide, and let your children's children re-echo it with pride. How Cardigan the fearless is named in mortal vain when he crossed the Russian valley with his glorious light brigade. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the 600. Oh, the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said, into the valley of death rode the 600. For the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not that the soldiers knew someone had blundered, but there's not to make reply, there's not to reason why, there's was to do or die into the valley of death rode the 600. <laughs> I thought uh, do or die is probably a good line to end on. Um, so what happened here? There's a written poem, a well-known written poem, that uh, has passed you know, sort of orally into Bob Mills's repertoire. There's a broadside ballad that was undoubtedly printed, but that he didn't get from print. There's all sorts of lines between literacy and, and orality sort of crossing there. So now I'm going to change tack completely from the uh, public bar to the... Uh, posh stage of the Royal Festival Hall in London. It was about, about 20 years ago, I was there with my wife Lona, before she became my wife, and we went to a performance of Bruckner's Fifth Symphony, um, a fantastic performance that actually w w lasts over an hour and it was conducted by Bernard Heitink with the Vienna Symphony Orchestra. Now to cut a long story short, at some point in that music I began to hear clear, popular, let's call it vernacular, 
elements in this music, which of course is a high blown 19th century symphony, a piece of romanticism. And as the piece went on, I stronger and stronger got this feeling uh, that there were these popular elements in it. And I mentioned this to Lona and she had heard exactly the same thing. So we had a very excited conversation afterwards. It seemed that these influences were caught up, kind of unmissable. Here's a very clear example, which I will ask Martin to play. It's the beginning of the third movement where Bruckner begins with a sort of pastoral scherzo, which doesn't last very long. And it goes straight into a landler, which of course is the mid European vernacular forerunner of the waltz. Can we just hear a bit of that, please? <laughs> very clear isn't it it's it is a kind of waltz and that sort of thing those sort of references occur throughout this piece but i have to say that when i want when i tried to sort of look this up in standard histories and so on uh, I, I got a blank i didn't there was hardly any mention well hardly any no mention of bruckner's relationship with popular music at all but listen i was i was sort of worried by that because Bruckner came from a small town in Austria in the 1830s. His father was a school teacher. Eventually he became composer, church musician and so on in Vienna. But my assumption was that in a small town or village at that time, there would surely have been local music making and it would have been probably unavoidable. As for oral tradition, oral transmission, I should say, any church music is his time would have known that Gregorian melody was learned as much orally as written. So therefore Bruckner would surely have known both sacred and secular oral musical cultures. Eventually, I found a sentence in the New World Encyclopedia, no less, which put me on the right track and I'll quote it to you. He worked for a few years as a teacher's assistant playing the fiddle by night at village dances to supplement his income. Aha, that's what I was looking for. This went a long way to explaining those popular touches that I heard in the Fifth Symphony. And indeed, he was absorbed in local music. There's this extraordinary piece, a curious piece called Albenzauber of uh, 1868, which is scored for horns, which are actually meant to imitate Alp horns, male chorus, baritone soloist and yodelers. So he certainly was picking up on local popular traditions. He also wrote some lancers and quadrilles for piano. And it seems to me, this is my guess, but one reason why these popular elements are rarely mentioned in commentaries about his work is that he didn't make a point of them. Unlike, shall we say, Vaughan Williams, uh, a generation or so later, in England or Bartok in Hungary or any of those people who consciously use folk music for for Bruckner there was no ideology of folk these influence simply flowed in and out of his music with no special mention my final anecdote is what anecdote is not one of my own it comes from Janas Moretti Marotti's essay a music of your own from uh, 1981 but before looking at it I'll just say that we are used to that scenario in which composers consciously use so-called folk influences in their music. You know, the Russian Five in the 19th century, Vorjak, Smetner, Vaughan Williams, the English pastoralists, Spanish nationalists, Kodai, Bartok, Benjamin Britten, a long list. This always assumes a one-way traffic from folk music into art music. The strength of Marotti's example that I'm about to give you is that it shows that this can work the other way round. 
he refers to cases where, as he says, opera music has been widely folklorized. And he reminds us that Bartok and Kodai in the 1920s collected folkloric variants of passages from the operas of the 19th century Hungarian composer Ferenc Erkel. To be completely specific and take up Marotti's examples, at the end of the first act of uh, Hunyadi Laszlo of 1844 comes a triumphant chorus to the words, the intriguer is dead, vile treachery has disappeared, long live the homeland, long live Laszlo the king. And this is the melody, I can't sing it in Hungarian, but this is the tune. defends itself against Ottoman Turks and Laszlo V survives a plot against him, although later in the story he comes to a sticky end. The melody, this melody from this opera, says Marotti, was subsequently sung in the streets and also appeared in the brass band repertory. After this, and again this is a quote, its folkloric transformations were creative and extended to the words Casual farm labourers used to sing songs about their bosses to that tune, with a mocking exaggeration of its pathetic gesture. Here's one set of words that Marotti gives that was sung to a variant of that very tune. Sir, foreman engineer, we remember you too. You played the dirty on us when threshing at Holiesses. Ask that straw-shaking fair Virgin Mary that we won't catch your scraggy neck in Civvy Street. Good strong stuff, isn't it? And the melody, the melody, it goes, I haven't got the uh, left-hand accompaniment, just the tune here. pretty clearly a version or a variant of that opera tune. Um, actually, of course, it does just miss out some of the chromaticisms of the opera tune, which we saw Bill Hingston doing on his One Row Melodian. So this example shows a process from opera to street song to brass band repertoire to protest song and then eventually interesting enough, to a bagpipe tune. This was collected by Kodai in Northern Hungary. It's still the same tune. still very much the same tune. These examples, I must say, remind me very much of a Melodian player I used to know in the uh, Dartmoor village of Chagford, George Allen. He was a postman and a union rep, and he was the heart and soul of sessions in the Three Crowns pub. He didn't play step dances, hornpipes, jigs, or all that stuff that is more sort of generally thought of as traditional but he certainly played the Merry Widow Waltz from Franz Lehar's uh, celebrated opera, operetta of uh, 1905. Bill Hingston played it too. George Allen also had a number of continental polkas and other well-known tunes from the light classical world, such as Drink, Drink, Drink from The Student Prince by Sigmund Rongberg. He also played that lovely song, Musi Den, German song, first printed in 1827 as an old melody from Württemberg in a volume called Folk Song Collected and Set for Four Voices, Friedrich Silcher. This old melody was also used as a patriotic song by the German military, as a sea shanty 
a naval march, and of course, as a popular song sung by Marlene Dietrich and um, Mirel Mathieu, uh, Nana Muscuri, and of course, Elvis Presley. I remember first seeing that. I wasn't very big. It was in G.I. Blues, silly film. And George also played the beer barrel polka, which of course many of us know as Roll Out the Barrel, but was also composed by a Czech composer in 1927. All these numbers and many more moved in and out of print and subsequently uh, circulated via uh, secondary oral sources, by which I mean sound recording, radio, film usage and so on. So. These anecdotes and examples have come from the 19th and 20th centuries. But was this two-way fluidity of musical ideas happening long before that time? Does it go back centuries? How many? If we take the word of the um, eminent musicologist and musical historian, the late Richard Taruskin, whose f enormous vol five volume history of the Oxford history of music is just like uh, incredible. <laughs> he says we can go a very way, long way back indeed. He, although he focused on the literate written traditions of Europe, he was careful throughout to mention oral traditions uh, where they were relevant. Um, and he goes right back to the origins of musical notation, to the pneumatic no notation of the ninth century, which developed in monasteries to give the monks some idea of um, uh, liturgies they already knew. So it wasn't like you were writing a new tune. Uh, they were an, a kind of mnemonic uh, thing. But of course, within the cloistered environments of those early monasteries, there was an oral repertoire, it was already there, and it was that that got written down, although always in partial form. But not just that, but it's reasonable to assume that even back then that those monks were not totally cloistered. I mean, they might have definitely heard uh, what other songs were being sung around them. The, the picture of the Merry Friar, who enjoyed all the music, dance and lust around him, was not entirely fictitious. And what was sacred Gregorian chant based on? Of course, it was a common fund of melody, according to Richard Taruskin, or melodic types from throughout Europe. But even so, even given this kind of evidence, musicologists most highly value written or printed sources and typically assume that we can say very little about the oral side of things. One person who doesn't think that is the South African uh, musicologist Peter van der Merwe, who uh, his uh, Roots of the Classical was published in 2004, and he writes, the great anonymous either receive no mention at all or merely a passing comment. Interesting. And he observes that it is astonishing how little use conventional musicology has for Roots. And Taruskin also uh, goes on about this a bit, and he says, literacy did not replace orality as a means of musical tradition, but gradually joined it. The two means of transmission, therefore, have always kind of bled into one another. Well, I say always, since the 19th, 9th century, probably, or at least since printing. Uh, there were, of course, um, um, to be sure, some, re some recent, fairly recent examples of cultures that were completely oral, didn't have much of the influence of literacy in them at all. When I first started my own field work, I was working with um, gypsy travellers, some of whom were non-literate, and that was quite clear. But even here, of course, many of their songs, including some of the oldest ones, have a history in and out of print, which includes broadside ballads. Taruskin says that um, his early chapters, which, which in other words means volume one of five, are dominated by the interplay of literate and pre-literate modes of thinking and transmission. But as he gets into his middle volumes, the classic period of so-called classical music, he keeps the balance very much in mind. He often refers to oral 
traditions. And in his final chapter, final book, I suppose, he encompasses oral, literate, and what he calls post-literate modes, which is very interesting stuff indeed. Okay. But his, his reference to thinking and transmission is interesting. And orality and literacy both come with ways of creating, composing, remembering and thinking. And with these come values. And if we understand these values, we also understand much about our musical culture, past and present. Uh, but here's a bit of a, um, a paradox. They are polarized into oral and literate. So there's definitely a, a big difference between them. Yet they are also holistic, whereby the two interrupt, inter, interact. So this needs unpacking. And to do so, I'm going to ask Martin to put up a, a, a slide on the screen of a famous painting from 1559, Bruegel's fight between Carnival and Lent. And there, and you probably will definitely recognize it. So down the right hand side of the painting are monks going in and out of a sacred building, a church or a monastery, perhaps. A few of them are mingling with lay people in the big town square, but in the rest of the square, there's music, a couple of lute like instruments, bagpipes, a round game with percussion instruments, and even a rommel pot. Uh, which is a sort of friction drum still played in Benelux, Benelux countries. Now the painting, of course, is skillfully assembled by Bruegel. This gathering of numerous local people was a composition, not what we would call a snapshot. But I think we are justified in taking it as ref reflecting some sort of socio-musical patternings. For example, at the very least, music in this can be seen as either ecclesiastical or vernacular. The chant of the monks or whatever was being chanted inside that church will doubtless have been learnt from written copies as well as orally, although perhaps not printed copies at that time. Um, but Bruegel's painting, in Bruegel's painting, there are many musics happening together. And I would suggest that this is undoubtedly how things were in many a local culture. It's impossible to, to suggest that there was a glass screen between social groups whereby they did not hear each other's music. Um, Jacques Attali made a commentary on this painting famously, and he sees it as a representation of order, the monks and the church, and disorder, the hoi polloi in the town square, or harmony and dissonance, or festival, which makes misery tolerable, and austerity, which promises eternity. And I'll refrain from contemporary political comment. These two ideological positions are enacted by the tumult of noise depicted in the painting itself. But from the point of view of how these are enacted, are we not in our entitled to add something that Attali does not mention, namely orality and literacy? And actually, this is where it gets interesting. We see before us a plethora of oral circumstances. Musical literary was almost unknown outside the monasteries or church life. Inside the monasteries, however, liturgical ch chant was sometimes written down, uh, but there was also, as we've, as I've said, on a few occasions now, an oral dimension to the liturgy. There were, of course, composers who were writing church polyphony, masses, motets, madrigals, and so on. But these are not depicted in the painting or not even suggested. But in the picture, in the same frame, in other words, in the same um, field of vision for us, we see that, that there is an enormous variety there. But think about it, ordinary folks who sang their songs, perhaps to their own accompaniment, um, un undoubtedly went to church at least sometimes, so they heard the other amount, the, the other type of music. Monks were not born monks, they became monks, so they must have heard something when they were kids. Um, they administered to the poor and could hardly not have heard or remembered music from that stratum of society. In short, actually, much of music history is here in this painting. 
and the dynamic between orality and literacy that it implies rumbles away consistently. Not depicted, but perhaps could be supplied by us, is the relationship between the two when it took a, a creative form, such as the way composers used popular songs as cantus firmus in settings of, of the mass. How many uh, missa l'homme armés were there, the mass of the soldier. We see some of this again in Hogarth's famous The Enraged Musician of 1741. I, I wonder if we can now see that one, Martin. Thank you. Um, and again, of course, you know, this is the artist who has assembled this composition um, all in one frame. But the point here, and the whole point of the picture really, is that the enraged musician in the window can't not hear what's going on in the street. And Hogarth, Hogarth shows us oral and written transmissions existing side by side, although not harmonium because the guy in the window was really not happy. The enraged musician is engaging in notated music. The street singer is singing a ballad called The Lady's Fall, the uh, ballad sheet actually has a, a title there of The Lady's Fall, which was already at least 100 years old when uh, this painting was done in 1741. It's not a painting, it's an engraving. Um, and then very in interesting is right in the top left there, there's a playbill stuck on the wall, partly obscured. And that is for the Beggar's Opera, which was the first ballad opera using street melodies and of course uh, these were all written down and they were learned by literate musicians who could read music there's even more there's even more scope in this uh, and by the way the beggar's opera was only a few years before this there's even more scope here because if you look at the figure in the window he has been identified by scholars as pietro castrucci a violin player, well that's right because he's got a violin there and a bow in one of his hands and he was the leader of the orchestra of Handel and of course if you think about Handel's music, the fireworks music, the water music and so on, much of that is based on um, popular dances, we might call them vernacular dances. There are hornpipes, jigs, sarabands, gavottes, there's a minuet, a bourre and so on, all that music uh, so, you know, like in six degrees of separation, we can start with this picture and then we can end up with uh, these sort of dances that were popular. Okay. So, thank you, Martin. We'll, uh, we'll go back to looking at my ugly mug now. Um, so, to summarise so far, my set of anecdotes illustrated the porousness of or orality and liter literacy some musicologists and music historians have at least acknowledged the interactions between the two and the Bruegel and the Hogarth have allowed us some quite informative glimpses of, of the workings of all this in the 16th and 17th century. Now to the values I mentioned associated with the two different means of transmission and performance. Writing or print cultures emphasise works as such, works of musical art. Oral cultures are characterised by variants. Works can be distributed and consumed as unique, although you only need two or more surviving manuscripts to complicate matters. Writing gives us ur texts. Orality gives us what used to be called oikotypes, locally current variants from a common basic structure. Print implies ownership, orality does not, although there are informal copyrights, that's true. Uh, written traditions can and do welcome innovation and experimentation from time to time, where oral forms tend to be conservative. Mind you, it is worth noting that both uh, Taruskin and van der Merwe warn against being too rigid in these distinctions, like um, serious versus popular music, for example, or the 18th century polite versus vulgar, classical versus folk, God forbid. And there are indeed some pitfalls here. The notion of roots is one. 
it implies that a simpler, popular, vulgar form is analogous to the roots of a plant in the ground and that everything grows upwards from there. But music and song ideas flow in all directions. The Marotti example showed us that. Opera to street song, oral lyric to symphony, art song to pub song. It's too easy to fall for the idea that the vernacular influence feeds the formal, which is what the 19th and 20th century musical nationalists believe. But if we went back a little further in time um, to before the word folk was used, we can see that formal musicians who actually were well known for writing and printing their music were nearly always part of an oral culture. The 18th century composer Joseph Haydn, one of the sort of the high points of the classical era, is a very good example. Long since he's been regarded as the father of the symphony and also the string quartet. But the interesting thing is that he came from an Austrian family in a tiny village where his father was a wheelwright, his mother cooked for the local knobs and neither could read music. His father played the harp by ear. The family and neighbours had get togethers when they sang from orally cir circulating local repertoires and Haydn so well known in the classical concert hall was thus at least originally and using that problematic term he was a folk musician and sure enough gypsy central european and croatian mel melodies later appear in his composed works there was a french musicologist that said actually michel brenet points out that actually it could have even worked the other way around that haydn could have he received from his local traditions but he could have given into brenet says why should not his own heirs have stolen through the open windows and remained in the memories first of the people whose duty it was to interpret them and then of the scattered population of the surrounding countryside to which the answer is that there's no reason why this shouldn't have happened and doubtless it did. So I'd now like to look at a bigger, bigger, bigger picture. Attali dis discussed the Bruegel painting in his book Noise, which is a real classic. And it is to Attali and his self-admitted theoretical indiscipline, which appeals to me, even if I don't understand exactly what it means, the idea of theoretical indiscipline. Uh, I would like to turn to, he writes that music is not innocent and that it provides a rough sketch of the society under construction. Interestingly enough, art doesn't just reflect life, it, may be, it maybe creates life. But we have to ask, does he refer to all music at all levels of society? Is some music and song more conservative than others? Does some look back rather than forward? Does some summarize what has happened rather than prophesize what might? How does this predictive uh, ability of music actually work? How do we relate to Attali's assertion that music is prophetic and that social organization echoes it? And I would suggest that it's here that the dynamic between orality and literacy becomes more than merely interesting. It may be crucial, although actually Attali has nothing to say about it. Uh, A.L. Lloyd in Folk Song in England injected a note of humanism into this discussion. Um, when he wrote of what he called folk and art music, they were, he argued, various blossom, blossoms from the same stock grown to serve a similar purpose, if destined for different tables, to which we might ask, yes, but how? What are the details? Surprisingly, even Lloyd barely touches on the parts played by orality and literacy. Casting around for a point of entry, I stumbled across Peter Mandeverver, van der Merwe's uh, reference to the Treatise on Harmony of 1722, written by Jean-Philippe Philippe Rameau, the composer. And Rameau proposed that the fundamental law of music that is to say, composed, written down European music, was that harmony tells you all you need to know about the music and that melody is an emerging quality of harmony. Here's a quick key quote from that work. It is customary to divide music into harmony and melody. 
He doesn't mention rhythm, actually. Though melody is merely part of the former, and a knowledge of harmony is sufficient for a perfect understand of every standing of every property of music, we should unpack these implications. First of all, whatever scales or modes were current in vernacular music before and during Ramo's time, if they were purely melodic, as they were, then they clearly have no place in his scheme. He basically proposes a contrapuntal music in which melody, which is one part, is placed over a bass line, which is another. In other words, tune and bass are equal, and whether or not the bass is ever actually present, it is always implied. And this musical model can be applied to the classical period of Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, and so on, up to early modernism, but it doesn't only apply to this kind of music. We find it in Ravenscroft, Durfee, Playford, a huge percentage of Chapel's popular music of the olden time. In other words, melodies in these sources tend to be mostly major key, some minor, and only a handful in what we call modes. Overall, in both classical and vernacular, there was a shift from music being melodic to harmonic. And incidentally, if Atelier is to be believed, this shift predicts shifts all round in social organisation and so on. We are, after all, talking about the era of changes from feudalism to mercantilism to capitalism. But at this point, I find myself recalling, but actually questioning an eloquent passage in Lloyd of English melody before 1750. He saw it as more vigorous, squarer, franker in cast, the harmonies dominated by the common chord, and we perhaps know what he meant. I know he relied on writing and print. He mentioned the Fitzwilliam Virginal book and chapel, although chapel was two centuries later. More feasible, feasibly, he might have added Ravencroft, Ravenscroft, Playford and Durfee. The rather four square tonal melodies were contrasted by Lloyd with what he saw as newer melodies, perhaps from mid 18th century onwards, which he wrote were rather dominated by the fourth. Their rhythm is elastic. They incline to hover and take unexpected directions. The formal structure is well enough declined, but their intonation may be so surprising as to baffle the unaccustomed listener. Lloyd put this change of melodic type down to changes in farming methods the rise of capitalist agriculture, the pauperization and melancholy these brought about in the English countryside. But there are problems here. One is that the meandering, typically modal melodies he wrote about and loved to sing, incidentally, constituted only a fraction of the Victorian Edwardian collections on which he based much of his observation. Given that the folk song collectors of that time are now known for their selectivity and preferences for certain types of melody, it could be said that the meandering modal melodies that Lloyd so admired, and Sharp, and Vaughan Williams and the rest, were actually in a minority when compared to all the rest of the reported repertoire. Furthermore, the, the urban print collections that Lloyd cites were probably not what was being sung and played in the country areas. The meandering melodies he saw as evidence of sudden rural alienation, actually in terms of melodic strakes, uh, shape and structure. But however, when you look at shape and structure, they fit well, those, those meandering melodies, they fit well with what we know of much older melody and may have been maintained by oral transmission in the countryside. The handfuls of modal melodies collected by collectors, in other words, may suggest older connections and were not the imports of Irish labourers that somehow struck a note in the English countryside, as Lloyd suggested. The preponderance of tonal, tonic dominant melodies in the classic folk song collections, as well as in the more urban collections, reflects something else, namely the musical paradigm we noted in Ramo, melody as an emergent quality of harmony. If Atelier's approach be applied here, the shift from melodic polyphonic to harmony driven musical culture 
occurs alongside and perhaps predicting the move from the medieval feudal worldview to the industrial capitalist. Um, perhaps we need a bit of a conclusion here, a bit of a ramble and I do apologise. Um, as a, as a, how these ideas affected me as a mere part-timer at a university, uh, I was lucky actually to have a departmental head who, in, who gave me my head. He, uh, he basically told, told me to design modules the way I wanted. And I taught music history through landmarks. I saw I did one session on orality and literacy and the invention of music notation and then medieval minstrelsy where orality and literacy are really important. The 14th century Ars Nova, which actually fixed notation uh, into the sort of almost uh, at least on the way to the, the, the notation we have today. I used the Fitzwilliam Virginal book because its oral sources are very clear. The Bruegel and the Hogarth paintings we've looked at. I did a lovely session in which Beethoven and Tommy Armstrong of Tyneside were compared. And it's really interesting to compare them. Um, then I talked about the dynamics of the folk song uh, concept. Each of these was a sort of a lecture on its own. American popular music in the 19th century. My aim was always to show that literate and non-literate transmission coexisted and you couldn't really understand one without the other. But I'll just give you two quick case histories to show how the landmarks idea works. Alan Dundas wrote a fascinating book in which he studied, as he called it, holy writ as oral lit. He takes many narratives from both the Old and New Testament in the Bible and shows how a high proportion of them are known in variants, different versions. This even applies to old stalwarts such as the Lord's Prayer or the Ten Commandments and the stories of the four New Testament Gospels. Dundas convincingly argues that the written variants, which in some cases are quite appreciably different from one another, are evidence of orality at work. Now this, to me, recalls some of our oldest songs and ballads. Take the myth of Orpheus, which we've always known from written sources, Ovid, Virgil, Plato, and later Boethius, and so on. Not to mention its very many retellings in operas and so on. For years, it was assumed that these were written narratives, but in the light of what we know about orality, it is clear that the written versions may have been points in the journeyings or meanderings of a narrative type that may well have been circulating orally before there was writing. As far as British song is concerned, we have three versions that substantiate the idea that a basic narrative was for floating around for centuries. There's the one in Child from the Singing of Andrew Coots, an old man in Unst, Shetland, which found its way into print in 1880. There was the one in the Shetland Times, written down uh, from one Bruce Sutherland in 1865. And of course, there's that remarkable fragment recorded by Pat Shaw from John Stickel of Lerwick, also in Shetland, in 1947. Now, it's interesting, the song is thought to be based on a 13th or 14th century poem in which Orfeo rescues his wife from the fairy king. There are three written manuscript copies extant, each with significant differences. The story of Orfe Orpheus becomes conflated with aspects of Celtic fairy mythology. Um, his beloved disappears into the clutches of the fairies. After 10 years, she's riding with the fairies when she sees Orpheo, and after various mystical adventures, comes to a kind of underworld where there are bodies of people long supposed dead, and his wife is among them. Orpheo plays the harp to the fairy king, winning back his wife, and the narratives of these are not the same exactly as the classical tragedy. There is no interdiction to Orpheus not to look back, for example. But if we employ the kind of structural analysis proposed by Prop in the 1920s, we can compare similarities, differences and changes in the narrative. We can, all, we can also see then that they are derived from the same stem if in fact they do become quite different. Um, 
I just thought it would be really nice at this point to hear that extraordinary, um, very much an oral, orally learned piece by sung by John Stickle. So I'm sure probably most people here will know it, but I'd love to just play it anyway. Well, ye come in at the old post, go when ever grey. You will come in at your hall, and yet and can granola. And we'll come in at your hall, go when ever grey. And we'll come in among ye all, for yet and can granola. First you play the notes of nice, go and hello grey, and then you play the notes of joy, for yet and can granola, and then you play the good old gathering, go and hello grey, which might have made a sick heart hill, for yet and can granola. Well, ye come in at the old post, go and ever grey. You will come in at your hall, and yet and can granola. And we'll come in at your hall, go and ever I think we went round again there, don't worry. So, but we don't need to go back to the ancient world or the British Middle Ages to see powerful examples of the oral Britain dynamic at work. Here, I always used to do a little class on uh, Scott Joplin and Ragtime. Uh, give you a perfectly good example. Joplin's musical story and background closely parallels those of Bruckner and Haydn. In other words, he was brought up in oral traditions. Before he could read music, uh, his father played the fiddle, his mother played the banjo, all the kids sang or played some kind of instrument. None could read music. However, uh, white people at that time liked their black entertainers to play waltzes, polkas, quadrilles, reels and so on. So Scott Joplin actually began to learn to read music in that way. The story is that his mother was a domestic servant and took Scott Joplin to work with her when he was a kid. And they had permission for the little boy to noodle on the piano. And the rest is really history. But the but the rag times, well, now, if you look at the drawing room piano tradition that Scott Joplin undoubtedly knew and learned pieces, I'll give you an example of something. I'll play the piano to you. This is a Scott Joplin rag, but it's not, because this is as it would have been had it been written within the written literate drawing room tradition. <laughs> That sort of music would not have been would not have been remarkable when Scott Joplin was growing up. Everybody knew that sort of music, white and black, certainly in the urban areas. Now, what about somebody who was brought up singing um, spirituals or, or sort of gospely type songs or uh, African American fiddle and banjo music, play party tunes, and so on, and uh, no doubt spirituals and work songs as well. A music which, in other words, uh, subverts that on the beat feeling that I've just played. Da. What about something that goes? And so on, right? We get, in other words, a form of music, a very powerful form of music, ragtime, which is which bears clear traces of both an oral and a literate tradition. Joplin went on to compose a symphony, a piano concerto, uh, four operas and so on, much of them no longer uh, around unfortunately, but also the ragtime pieces, or at least some of them, the most popular ones, went back into an oral tradition. So they, they came, if you like, from both, oral and written. Um, then they became very much written pieces. And then jazz musicians, like everyone from Sidney Bechet, for example, who played the maple leaf rag, uh, 
Anthony Braxton and Muhal Richard Abrams, much more avant-garde, did a fantastic version of Maple Leaf Rag in the 1970s or 80s, I suppose. So it'd be a very long uh, but fascinating discussion to see how the introduction of syncopation in music predicted all kinds of, ch of changes in manners, culture, aspiration and production, just as Atalie said we could. So my aim has always been to show that literate and non-literate transmission coexisted and you couldn't really understand one without the other and that my friends is it I've gone on for an hour I hope it wasn't too rambling and uh, I do thank you for listening thank you very much thank you thank you Sam that, that was great although I'm not sure I had followed all of it but it was wonderful um we do have time for questions if anybody wants to um, I don't know which screen I'm looking at, but they've put their hands up. Just one small point that the Bob Mills um, balaclava thing, presumably he learnt the Tennyson poem at school. He may well have done, yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm so silly, I didn't ask him. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I mean, that that's what it's out. You know, we know they did, the people at that time did learn that kind of poem at school. So it's, yes, definitely. that's likely, isn't it? Yes, yeah, very likely indeed. Yeah. Um, is anybody going to put their hands up? Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, we, we have recorded this, so it will go up on the website. Wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Hmm. Sorry, somebody talking? Vic, you got your hand up. Vic, you're muted. Right, no, no, so thanks very much. That was very interesting. I mean, I absolutely buy the interaction of um, uh, literate and non-literate music. So, uh, and nice to hear a thumbs up for, for Peter van der Merv. I think that and his first book, the, the Origins of the Popular Style, I think is it's speculative, but it really is interesting. And, and I think it's got so much going for it. Uh, what I can't buy is this predictive link thing. Uh, you know, I, I was trained in history, not in music. And, uh, you know, we look for evidence and we look for linkages. I mean, I, I actually critiqued that Lloyd passage that you, you quoted a long time ago. I mean, I just don't see uh, now musical styles certainly respond to the the cultural economic situation that they're in. They, they you know, if you don't have any money for musical instruments, in, in your budget, you can't buy musical instruments. It's no, uh, it's no coincidence that the people who played in church bands in Britain from the mid uh, 18th to, to the, say, the mid 19th century tended to be artisans and people with a bit more disposable income than the labourers, uh, and so on. So I think you know, economics are always constraining musical possibility. I don't know what the links are of the predictive aspect of it. I, I think Attali, I mean, Attali went on to, didn't he break the World Bank nearly? I mean, he was such a, <laughs> a strange character. I read that book in France in a rainy, in, in a hotel in Dunkirk. And, and um, it was, I just found it a very strange experience. Uh, you know, I just, I want to know what the links are, if there are links. Um, I mean, a lot of the other stuff, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't begin to disagree with it because uh, certainly, I mean, you find this in, if you go through the, I mean, vernacular musicians have been using manuscript books, musically literate manuscript books since the 17th century, you have them from the late 17th century. Mm. And in there, you'll find the works a, a bit of Haydn, you'll find some Mozart, you'll find Pleyel, you'll find along with hornpipes and jigs and so on. You know, that is not, I think, you know, it, it's really sharp and going back to that sort of thing that, that, that you know, wants this folk music to be somehow separate and, and away from the mainstream. And I really think we're, you know, it's hard to break that down. So that's the first thing. The other thing was, I think that there are, we can talk about interactions, but um, we, we also need to talk about musical traditions and the way in which they set up parameters and possibilities. I mean, I had the, I worked for a time as a teacher trainer and I happened to work in Huddersfield. Uh, 
which if you know anything about brass banding is sort of almost the epicenter of great brass banding. I had people in my training as teachers from Black Dyke Mills, from Bessies of the Barn, from Sellers, from all these fantastic brass bands. And they were lovely, mostly lads, not all lads, but mostly lads. They were great people, but they had a way of doing things. They had a way of doing things which was, you know, we, we, you could throw a piece of complex music at them and they'd go look at it and they'd go and they would play it beautifully. And then you say next week, we're going to do some improvisation. They would say, what? <laughs> you know, they really wouldn't be able to sort of uh, even in, in tune. So I don't think it's just about where the bits of the tunes come from and where they go. I think it's about ways of doing things. I mean, I can back this up by I, I wanted to I worked uh, oddly enough with someone I criticised quite severely, Peter Holman. And I wanted to say that there were surviving oral traditions um, in, in, say, the, 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 the psalm singing in Lewis and the um, sacred harp music and, and, and the Sheffield carol singing and so on that were descendants of 18th century church music. And they, he just didn't want to know that. He didn't want to know that because he was so imbued with this historical periodic sort of notion. Sorry, I'm rambling on, but, but it was a very stimulating talk and thank you very much. Well, thank you, Vic. Um, uh, your first point about Atali and the way music predicts society, if you like, um, I don't think I made my point very clear there, but what I was trying to say was that he seems to make this as a kind of a blanket statement. Uh, and, uh, and what I said in the talk was, but does this apply to all music? Is what, you know, the, the, the oral traditions tend to be more conservative. So perhaps they summarize a lot, or as you've said, you know, they, they have quite strong parameters of their own. Um, so what music, which kind of music has got this, <laughs> this kind of uh, thrust towards changing everything? And I would say that there are some examples, but that they would they would either tend to be very experimental music or uh, maybe something like jazz in the 20s or rock and roll in the 50s uh, certainly changed an awful lot of social things. Um, you know, the way people related to one another, uh, sexual mores, dress, you know, relationships. Uh, so it may not have changed anything particularly political, but it certainly changed social and personal life. And I think the jazz age did too. And I, yeah, I'm, but you, you've got real problems of cause and effect there. I mean, you know, was it a symptom of changing mores or was it, a, 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 you know, I agree that, the, you know, the, the, the outrage against ragtime when it comes out, you know, this is going to deprave humanity and so on. You know, it was it was a, sh a social shock. But in a sense, was it just I don't know how we can tell the difference between cause and effect. And so I can't base have nothing to base that causality on. Well, uh, in terms of rock and roll and the way it impacted on sexual mores, I would have to agree with you because, you know, some decade was it before rock and roll came Kinsey and there were all sorts of differences that arose because of that so I think in all these cases you could do something like that you could trace it back to say well this was in the air you know it wasn't only done by rock and roll or jazz it was there on the other hand I mean those are two examples from popular culture that sort of particularly in the 50s had almost immediate mass uh, catchment you know so <laughs> Uh, much, much more difficult, I think, to take a historical source and make that argument for it. Hmm. I just asked you a stupid question. Atali, is that A-T-H or A-T-T? -T? It's A-T-T. -T. Right. It's A -T -A -F, yeah. And the book you're talking about is Noise, is it? It's called Noise, yeah. It came out in the 70s, but I forget which year it was. Um, uh, like Vic, I found it a very odd reading experience. There were one, one or two things in it that I just thought, what the hell is he on about? Uh, like music is a simulacrum of ritual murder, pardon. Um, but I persisted with it. I found it was one of those books that you have to sort of read to the end and be very slow with. 
But I have to say, I've tried, tried to read it on two or three occasions since then. And the last time I read it, which was this year, it suddenly became much clearer to me. And also the, the, the gaping holes in it became clearer too. Right. Thank you. Any more questions? Anybody else want to say anything? I mean, as a, oh, Ian, have you got your hand up, Ian? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, about Marotti, I've not been able to find the paper that you referred to. It was in the first of the popular music journals. Okay. And it's called A Music of Your Own. That was 1981, I think. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And while I'm speaking, thank you. That's absolutely fascinating. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Right, as I was saying earlier on, we this is being recorded, so it will be on the web, on the our YouTube channel soon. Uh, if you want to come back and, and dip into it, but, uh, if nobody else has got any comments, then thank you, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Uh, we'll be back with our normal um, routine on December the. 11th that's right december the 11th is our net it's our christmas too so thanks again a round of applause for sam <laughs> is there, martin is there anything else i should be saying martin is there anything else i should say i don't think so steve um okay we'll see you all again in december then december the 11th Thanks very much for coming, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.